Welcome to our first uh, workshop session of BioC. Uh, my name is Andrew McDavid. I am a research scientist at Ozek Technologies, and here with me today is also Arpan Nupan, who's a computational biologist at Ozet. And um, so we're going to be talking about uh, analyzing flow cytometry experiments with Cetiverse. And so um, why are we talking to you from Ozet? Well, the Cetiverse um, was developed by a number of folks who are now at Ozet and were formerly at, um, in Rafael Gotardo's group at Fred Hutch Cancer Center. So um, fortunately, uh, Ozet's still very interested in supporting uh, this technology. In fact, we use it as part of our own core technology. So, um, and, Partially our own motivation to make sure that the documentation is up to date and provide a better introduction for ourselves as well as anyone else who would like to use it. So there's a number of, I guess, before I launch more into my spiel here. So this workshop is something that you yourself can follow on along. Um, and I think we showed the link earlier, but uh, maybe we'll go ahead and show it to you again. So you can, um, Let's see here, did I have it? But I, did I put a link in here? No, I thought I did. So I think you need to go to workshops.bioconductor.org and then make an account if you don't already have one. So let's go ahead and take a look at that here. So workshops, bioconductor, shop.bioconductor.org. There we go. All right. So um, if you don't have an account, it's quick and easy to make an account. You'd click register, put in your email, uh, make an account and so forth. And then once you get to that, uh, you get to a screen that um, I'm not going to try to log on to here. Uh, well, you know what? We'll go ahead and do it together. <laughs> So then you just need to recall your password, something very super secure and inscrutable, I'm sure. on the first attempt. All right, so then um, over on the left side of the um, workshops menu here, you'd go ahead and find the workshop that you're here to see today, which is um, reproducible analysis of flow cytometry experience with the Cetiverse. Click launch. Um, I already did that, and mine appears over here in active workshops, uh, and that is what we have in this window that I've got open here. So. Um, so, um, yeah, we have a, a very ambitious schedule here that we're not going to get through all of, but um, some of this you'll be able to work on your own as you have your questions arise. But uh, in general, we're going to try to talk about importing flow cytometry data and then some of the core data structures that are used once you manage to get your flow cytometry data into R and um, talk about compensation and transformation of data, which uh, is, ha has its share of subtleties. I, th I think our goal is to at least have it so that if you don't know about this, and I until recently didn't know much about it myself, you at least know what sorts of questions to ask when you, and if you're running into issues with compensation. And then uh, really the last part that I think we're gonna have hope of getting through today is to talk a bit about gating here. Um, so, as you can see, there's a number of other uh, vignettes that we wrote that uh, I think will be too ambitious for us to get through today. 
Um, so besides this, once you have logged on to the workshop platform here, you should, you'll get to something that looks like this RStudio server um, session here, and you'll probably be browsed into the vignettes directory. So right now I'm looking at the top level readme file. So if you go up a level, you can see uh, all these contents that are up on my screen here. Um, and if you want to see rendered versions of these rather than the um, our markdowns themselves, you can go to this website that is also linked in the readme here. So cdn.ozetai.com slash shadowverse biosu 2023 slash index. Um, but yeah, please don't feel as if you need to memorize that. Uh, it, the, the link is available here in the readme.md. So we'll, we'll uh, move back and forth between the rendered versions of this as well as the uh, RMD source themselves here. Um, so any questions or issues so far? Sweet, all right, so let's get to it. Um, so full cytometry data, for better or worse, has been the, I think, standardized to be interchanged or at least come off the instrument as an FCS file. And this file contains both um, the raw data, which you can think of as essentially some matrix that's got, uh, you know, the rows or cells or events and the columns are uh, fluorescence intensities associated with that event. Um, as well as some metadata that is in some cases somewhat standardized. So maybe there's some hope that we can actually um, do something with this metadata across files. So um, the first goal here is going to be able to interact with this FCS files in R. Um, and uh, But before you do that, you probably need to install some packages. That's already been done for you if you manage to log on to this um, RStudio instance on Galaxy, and the way that this was done is that there's a Docker container that has been built that contains um, the Devel version of Bioconductor as well as uh, the packages that were needed for this workshop. And so, um, you know, you, if you wanted to do this on your own machine, you could do it the old school way of using BioC Manager install, and then you could install all these packages that are listed here. If you want to do work strictly within the container and you trust the container that we're building through GitHub Actions, which um, I think isn't going away, it's going to be there as long as GitHub is around. Um, in which case, you can. There's some additional instructions that are linked to in the README about how you can use this Docker container on your own outside of Galaxy. So that's another option too, and that's actually how we developed these materials was using this Docker container outside of Galaxy. So that does work. Um, so for the, at the moment here, we're just going to um, really need to concern ourselves with really two packages, um, FlowCore and Flow Workspace, which are the workhorses for interacting with FCS files in Bioconductor. Um, and we're going to work with a couple of data sets that we got off of flowrepository.org um, that we've subsetted down. So if you're curious to see more about where these data come from, we've got links to the their provenance here on flowrepository.org. Flow um, so within the Cytoverse, there's four different uh, S4 classes and data structures that are used in order to model FCS files. And those are uh, the Cytoframe, which you can think of as um, kind of a, a glorified data frame in that it's going to be rows or cells or events and columns or um, measurements, fluorescent measurements. And then there's some metadata on it. Um, there's a cytoset, which is if you have more than one FCS file and we want some structure that glues these together with some useful metadata, then that's what you get in a cytoset. Um, if we want to attach gates onto these, which if you don't know what a gate is yet, that's fine. We'll show some examples of this um, shortly. But uh, we've got another object here that models this notion of um, gates. Uh, and then if finally, if we want to have gates on not just one sample, but a set of samples, we've got a gating set. So um, a lot of these methods work uh, kind of interchangeably as you'd hope, but there are some notable departures from that where you need to know kind of the specific method in order to act with one of these specific 
data structures here, but um, we're, yeah, we'll try to cover those distinctions where they come up. So when we're reading in FCS files, there's two ways we could do it, um, depending on if we want to initially model the experiment as a whole. So really the interaction between multiple FCS files. So if we just want to look at one FCS file at a time, we might read it as a cytoframe, whereas if we have a whole experiment and associated metadata, we could read it as a cytoset. Um, and I think uh, we have this as a parenthetical comment here, but it's actually probably, it could be pretty important if you're a um, working bioinformatician who gets dumped some experiment from a biology collaborator. So the most commonly used tool uh, if you're a wet lab biologist that doesn't do a lot of programming is Flojo. And in fact, you, we also have uh, the plumbing in order to read these in. So if you want to do that, you should take a look at the Cyto ML package where there's a function that reads in Flojo workspaces. Um, so uh, normally when you're reading an FCS file or an experiment, it comes as uh, in some directory structure and unfortunately, they're probably are gonna have some metadata that was recorded in the file name and probably in some ad hoc, not entirely consistent manner. So um, that's gonna be an important uh, way that you might interact with um, an experiment. So you can think of, you know, you get some, someone gives you a zip file and says, aha, analyze my data. It might look like this, right? Um, so we'd like to have actually, have an example of that realistic scenario for the workshop, but for technical reasons, uh, we couldn't distribute like all these files here, you know, or several hundred megabytes. Instead, we are having to interact through these with the file cache. And I don't really want to spend too much time talking about the file cache unless you really want to geek out about BIOC file cache. Um, in which case you can, I guess, take a look at this. But uh, otherwise, it, let's just say we are um, the way that we're going to uh, I'm going to go ahead and skip through all these um, details here down to line 141, where we finally actually load in a FCS file using load cyto frame from FCS. So this is a function within uh, Flow Workspace. So let's go ahead and do that and see what we get out. So uh, I'm a firm believer of um, learning languages the hard way rather than copy and paste, like type stuff, re type stuff in by hand. And it also is I think amusing for spectators because when I make typos, we have to see like if I can figure out what the typo was and uh, while working live after taking a red eye and sleeping like three hours. So this is like Let's see if that works. Oh, it didn't because I think we need to load site overs 2023 package first. All right, so now you probably you should be prompted to make a um, cache directory. Go ahead and say yes. Hmm. It's a fun. Error that I wasn't expecting. That looks a little bit better to me. All right, so we're downloading the file cache here. And now, well, voila, all right, success. So um, we can see here that if we print out CF object, it says it's a cytoframe object with uh, 103,000 cells and 33 ob observables. And there's some information about what those observables are. These are like the um, channels. Um, 
So there's three uh, methods that are useful to interact with a cytoframe, and these three methods get at slots that are in the cytoframe object. So the first is XPRS, which gets us um, the expressions matrix. So if you um, are familiar with uh, um, what was this expression set, right? The very uh, old school original class to model gene expression, um, then you probably know this EXPRS method. Uh, so as you can tell, some of these packages have been around for quite some time. Um, share some of those kind of legacy features from Bioconductor. So another one of those features is that if you call um, get out the parameters, which is a um, slot that contains information about the channels. Uh, we get out an annotated data frame. So you know, whenever you get an annotated data frame, you probably just want to call wrap it with pdata. Um, it means maybe somebody somewhere has used the annotations. Uh, I don't know if there are anything. So if we call pdata on this annotated data frame, we actually get out. Um, you can see this is, gives us the name, something called desk that we'll talk about momentarily, and then some information about the bounds of measurement for each of these. Um, and the last method here is keyword. So this gets out various metadata that were um, presumably added on the instrument when the measurement was taken. So you can see there's a bunch of stuff in here. Um, some of these actually ref reflect the channels. Um, and uh, yeah, so we could look at that in more detail, I guess, probably with STR uh, keyword. So. Yeah, quite a bit of stuff in there. Um, so we've already given away some of the uh, some of the mystery here. That um, besides just thinking of like columns of the expression matrix as um, features generically, there's actually a useful distinction here between a channel and a marker. So the channel you can think of as really the feature, I guess, and the marker means that there's some um, antibody associated with it. So example of a channel that is not a marker would be if we looked back at my little code here that um, got out the parameters here. So you can see we've got some of these um, uh, channels here were called, uh, we've got forward scatter area, forward scatter height and side scatter. So these along with time are things that don't aren't associated with an antibody. And so we would we're, we would use them differently in some um, aspects of modeling. So this is maybe like if you come from single cell expression world, you could think of this as being like a separate either alt exp that it would treat differently from just like the uh, gene expression component of the assay. Um, and then, yeah, so lastly, we've got expression here. Um, so each row is an event and each column is a channel. So, uh, set of frames as we'd hope end up working similar to a data frame uh, in their indexing syntax. So if we do something like CF, uh, how do we think we'd get like maybe the first 100 cells here? Anyone wanna shout out a guess? Our first 100 events. Good guess, hopefully it works. And it does pleasantly enough. It says we got a set of frame with 100 cells and 33 observables. So um, analogously, if we wanted to get uh, the first four panels out of here, right? This is going to work as we'd hope. Um, and then, likewise, dollar CF dollar is going to subset by um, the channel names. So. Um, here, I guess, would be useful if we had some way to style this in a way to really call it out. So uh, unlike most other functions in R, when we do this sort of subsetting, this does not implicitly make a copy of the data. So most of the time, like most of the time when you're working in R, you don't need to worry about um, passing data around. It just magically passes a new value. Um, there's not any sense of pass by reference until you start talking about environments. Or reference classes, um, but for um, memory performance reasons, basically all the Cytoverse does have this feature where you need to worry about 
the difference between passing things by reference or passing by value. So this uh, can be a real foot gun. Um, I think Arpan and I have managed to shoot ourselves in the foot with this a few times. And so one of my goals here will be that you can see the carnage after you um, accidentally conflate uh, getting a value versus a reference here. So you quickly can understand that you've uh, the source of your curious behavior. So we'll try to, yeah, really inoc inoculate us against this particular um, bug that you can make here. So uh, we already looked at this little business here where we took the parameters and then called pdata on it in order to get it as a data frame because it was an annotated data frame. And maybe we can look at the first 10 keywords here. You can see there's maybe some more important stuff in the first 10. Like this dollar FIL can be pretty important when you're trying to match up to metadata. Um, so, all right, so let's talk about columns or call channels versus markers. So if we want to just get all the channels, um, we can use call names, CF. If we counted these, we should see that there's 33 of them here. And some of these are um, physical parameters and some of them are fluorescent. Uh, well, there's something. Hmm. We'll, we'll try to figure out what the something is here in a moment. Um, and then if we wanted to actually get the marker names, which were something that was programmed into the instrument, then we can do that with marker names. So now we can see this is a named character vector and the names of it match up with the call names here, right? So the names are the channels and then the values of this named character vector are, tell us something about the antibody. Um, so evidently this first channel was an antibody against TCR V Delta one. Uh, the second one was against CD127 and so forth. Um, so, but what is, why do we have like B and then some number and then we have more Bs and then some number here? Any guesses? Uh, that's okay. Let's, let's actually, let's, Ruminating on that, as I, as I don't want to give away our pawns section on compensation, but it's going to have to deal with, right? So there's, we're shooting lasers at things and lasers have a characteristic wavelength. So that's got to be these, and these do look like wavelengths of like visible light, right? Yeah. And then we've got dyes and those also have something to do with light. So anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll yeah, we'll, let's, meditate on that and we'll get back to it here. Um, and then if we wanted to get the channel ranges out, which I actually, I don't know, do we, what do we use channel ranges for, Arpon? No. Just, it's good to know. All right, so if we call range, then this tells us the, um, I guess this repeats it as a data frame, so it got hidden in my mark down here. Okay, so the min and the max for each of these channels. Um, Expression matrix, we can subset that also by cells or by markers. And then because we're treating this like it's a data frame, then we'd hope that the number of rows in CF should be the number of cells it is, and the number of columns in CF should be the number of markers, and it is. Um, so we've got some, because of this kind of indirection between the names of the columns of this matrix, like um, which are the channel names versus maybe the thing that we care about is actually like which channel has CD4 in it. There's some convenience functions here. You could just like, you know, do some regular expression matching in order to pull out the one that's CD4, or you could just like read it out of this here and then paste it in. But if you're um, lazy, you could use this uh, convenience function here. So this is going to get us the um, the name of the channel that matched CD4, and so this channel was called U785A. So then, if we wanted to get expression from the this channel, we could call EXBRS on the side of frame indexing by this channel by name. 
and lo and behold, we get a um, one by n uh, matrix out. So it looks like actually we're not going to drop, uh, we don't drop the dimension and coerce this down to a vector. Um, and then, yeah, we also saw already that we could subset by cells here. So, um, yeah, so this is always, whenever we do this, right, we're always getting an alias view on the CF. And that means that whatever we do to this alias here, we're actually doing to CF. So if we shoot SCF in the foot, we actually shot CF in the foot. Um, and likewise, if we, you know, if we tickle uh, S2 underscore CF, CF is going to laugh. So that's what it means when we're aliasing these objects. Um, if we don't want to do that, we need to tell uh, Flow Workspace that we want to realize the view, and so this makes a, actually makes a copy of um, the underlying object and breaks the link between these two things. So let's um, see how that works here. So let's say we wanted to rename uh, our CD4 marker to test. So let's go ahead and do that. So the way that we could rename um, the marker is there's also an assignment version of marker names where we pass in a named character vector into it. So let's first make that named character vector up here. Okay. I think I did that. This is extra interesting because I can't actually read the bottom of the screen here, so I don't ever know if I typed any typed it in uh, as I desired. Um, so let's go ahead and take the first 150 events out of CF, and now we're going to realize the view in order to um, make a copy of this rather than aliasing CF. So uh, here's what the marker names look like in the subset, they should look exactly the same as the marker names in CF. Or names CF. Uh, true, excellent. Um, and then let's go ahead and update these um, marker names in CS sub with our new ones here. And we should see that now the um, marker name associated with uh, U785, which is somewhere in here, right? Ah, here it is. All right. So yeah, we, we renamed it in um, CF sub, and in fact, potentially, okay. maybe. <laughs> so now we have one string mismatch. So we did manage to update these. Uh, So uh, let's see here. Yeah, so I'm going to skip over this little bit of exercise. Well, no, we'll we'll talk about this because. Um, so let's say um, we wanted to uh, update the. Um, something about how we're modeling the expressions in a channel here. So first of all, we can go ahead and just see what kind of the normal distribution of fluorescence is on this channel. Uh, it looks like it's got some, you know, skew on the right here. Uh, and it seems to be unimodal. Um, so one thing that you might do if you have heavily skewed data is maybe um, some transformation to reduce the impact of outliers. 
like log transform it. Uh, Sorry, I'm not used to last year. Screen. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, I still see it there. But do we just of, do we just yeah get out of full screen here? Yeah, we mucked it up somehow. Oh, because this is just the um. So just stop share and reshare maybe. Yeah. We're good. All right. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so yes, these, I mean, Cytoff data is also interchanged with FCS files, so you can read them in like this. There, I mean, there are definitely differences when we get down to like the next uh, vignette about compensation and transformation, and also the gating can be quite different for Cytoff, but as far as just interacting with the, the um, data structures here, yeah, that's, this is um, analogous. So um, let's say we wanted to do something called a hyperbolic arc sign transformation, which is one of the commonly used transformation. And Arpon will talk a little bit more about this. So um, we could just left assign to the expressions matrix uh, after um, you know applying this function to the this particular channel here. And if we um, plot this see that now the distribution looks quite different than it did before. Um, but uh, actually, this we only kind of did half of the homework here. So if you do this type of ad hoc transformation with AXPRS, it doesn't update the data range. So there's other um, better supported pieces of the API that do transformation that we'll talk about uh, momentarily here. But anyway, just so you know, that's how you can do it, interact with the low level expression matrix. So um, hmm, let's ponder a couple of these. Uh, maybe we won't actually try to answer them. So if I ask the length of the call names here, I get 33 out. If I ask for the length of the marker names, I only get 29 out. Why do I only get 29 here and 33 up here? Maybe we can look at the things again here. Well, there seem to be some things that were missing from here, right, that were in the call names. And so those were these physical parameters, the ones that didn't weren't associated with antibodies. Um, and uh, we'll, I'll leave these other exercises as homework in the interest of trying to get through more of the material here. So, okay, so we talked about one single um, FCS file. If we want to do interesting statistics, we're going to need more than an N of one, even, it even if it had 100,000 cells in it. Don't, you know, careful if you tell that to the SCR and seq biologists here, right? Uh, which I count myself one of them. Um, so uh, if we wanted to load a cytoset from an FCS file here, or from a set of FCS files, let's first see what we get out from this get workspace data function here, just know what we're playing with. So this is giving us a set of six um, FCS files and then where they live inside the file cache. So this load set of set from SCS takes a um, character vector of paths um, and then gets us a, a set of set. Um, and so a set of set, uh, also has some indexing properties here. So um, we can, if we index it with single square brackets, the first index is gonna get us samples. Uh, so if we do CS one colon two, that gets us the first two samples. And uh, I don't know, what do we get if we index over here? 
we get a set, all six of our elements of the set, but we get a subset of the column names here. Uh, and we also still get a, a nice warning message about how the set of set has been subsetted and can be realized through realized view. So again, we've got the opportunity to, um, yeah, alias this and um, both save memory as well as lead to difficult to diagnose bugs if you don't realize that you've aliased the object here. So the other thing that we get um, with the side of set is the ability to attach metadata to it. So at the moment, there's not any metadata associated with this besides just the file name that this came from. So here you can see this is often named, oftentimes the file name ends up being like the primary key that you're gonna have to use in order to map other metadata to things. So, um, you know, you get to do some like fun string munging in order to extract bits and pieces from a file name a lot of times. Um, but here we'll suppose that we had some metadata that was um, already given to us or we'll make it as a data frame here. So, so let's say we've got so someone kindly bequeathed us this um, metadata here. So it's a data frame with six rows matching our six elements of the set of set. And then uh, let's go ahead and try to add it to the the set of set here by left assigning to it. Uh, oh, dang. All right, we got an error. Um, so this error uh, arguably could be a little bit more clear here, but this is saying that we want um, to have a explicit key between the metadata and the P data here. And the way that we set set this keen is by the row names of the data frame need to match the cyto sample names of the cyto set. So we can see the sample names of this are the file names. Um, so as long as we were sure that our metadata was actually sorted in the same order as this row names of the um, set of set, we could go ahead and do this rather dangerous looking operation. Uh, you know, I'm asserting this, so it must be true. Um, so now we've managed to set the um, set the p data here. So of course this is a, like a nice quality of life improvement because now we can subset the set of set um, by using the the p data in it. So if we wanted to get out just like elements that were from uh, had a a different um, panel run, so a different set of markers associated with the channels, then we could get that out by subsetting the set of set as so here. Uh, okay, so now once again, we're gonna talk a little bit more about uh, aliasing, just to really hammer this point home here. Um, so, uh, just as with the cyto frame, uh, we need to worry about aliasing the cyto set. So let's look at the range of uh, the marker that was on channel 515. And let's go ahead and take a subset of it. So, you know, we're, we're gonna work with the first um, sample in the cyto set. We'll call it, assign it to an object called CS small. So just go ahead and see what's in there. So, okay, it's a side of set with one sample. Fantastic. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about what this means here, but we'll, tr we'll transform this. So this is just as we'd done before using, or similar to what we've done before by left assigning with the ex EXBRS method. Um, but now we're are using this more bells and whistle complete function called transform list. So this is gonna make uh, a function that we're saying will apply to channel 515 and we're gonna apply the hyperbolic sign to it. And let's go ahead and transform CS small. And then let's look at the range of CS small. All right, so it is um, diminished here, right? The maximum range is now 13 rather than being in the thousands. So what are we gonna find on the range of CS? Did it change? Well, I tickled CS small, so CS, CS is gonna laugh because they were alias. So yes, it did change as well. So this 
Now it's also reporting the range to be five to 13. So if we didn't want this behavior, we would have need to realize this view. And if you want to do a little bit of introspection about what um, the actual backing store is of a particular object where we have this um, aliasing semantics, um, fortunately there is some machinery that lets us do this here. So the function that you'd want to learn is um, get URI. So this works for both site of frames and set of sets. So if you call CF get URI, and we look at our CF here, you can see it's um, some gobbledygook ending in uh, FF6 here. Um, so as you might gather, actually the backing, underlying backing store of these things are HDF5 files. And uh, there we're like mapping these to memory somehow and we're working with them in order to um, in order to work with data that's larger than memory. So if we wanted to understand why when I tickled CS small, CS laugh, we can look at the URIs here. So both the URI of CS small and CS uh, and in uh, F0 A8, right? So that's the same, the same object on disk that they're pointing to. Um, and so again, if we call realize view, then we will break the link between these two things. So let's go ahead and try that here. So if we call realize view on CS small, and then we get the URI of this. Call CS get URI rather than CF get URI. And we can see that now this ends in 4A70 rather than F0A8. Um, so I think we won't belabor this rest of this exercise here. Um, so uh, set of sets are nice because they let us map metadata onto this list of set of frames. Um, but in some cases, we want to be able to go back and forth between list-like semantics and set-like semantics. Um, so uh, in some cases, you might be able to avoid this back and forth if you wanted to say, like, add a sample to the cytoset. So we've got this um, CS add cytoframe method here. So let's go ahead and first um, realize a view of the first element of the cytoset here. Um, so we can add us back to, we can add the third element of the set of set to CS small by calling CS add cyto frame. And so as you might gather, when we index CS with those double brackets here, this actually reports error. All right, technical difficulties, folks. Sorry, I just got booted from the workshop for some reason here.
Uh, all right. Um, all right, well, I am no longer sharing screen. That's it. Yeah. Um, okay, so, um, yeah, so if we wanted to add uh, an element to a set of frame, we've got a method that does that directly or um, we could uh, coerce it to a list and then um, coerce that list back to a set of set. So maybe we can ponder that here. So if we get, um, So now we just have an ordinary uh, S3 list. Um, and so this is useful in that uh, maybe there's functions that we want to apply to each element of um, the set of set as a set of frame. Um, so we could course it as a list, or actually we've got a function that does this directly. So fs apply is like the analog to s apply in base R. Um, so if you wanted to get the number of cell events that were detected or that were run in each element of this, we could call um, fs apply yes and row. So this by default simplifies this into a um, kind of a array like structure. If you don't like that behavior, and maybe you shouldn't like that behavior if you're trying to program with this because this can cause surprising um, changes in the output type. Uh, you could set simplify equals false here, and then you would just get a list out. Um, hmm, so what, maybe we can uh, freestyle an exercise here. Uh, oh, well, it was already an exercise. So, do we think that cytosets have to have the same panel, like the same markers always? Arpon shaking his head no. And I think that's the case also that you can't, but let, what if we like wanted to find out through experimentation, how could we figure that out here? Any ideas? Well, we know that marker names on like a cytoframe does something useful and if we index it with a single with double square brackets there on a cytoset, then we get the cytoframe semantics here. So that does this on one. Well, we could like repeat this like on each one of the six elements of CS and uh, you know, see what we get out, see if they're the same. Uh, is there a quicker way we could do this? Should we try FS apply? Let's see what we get out here. Oh, okay, that's kind of cool. So it seems like the answer is no, that we don't have to have the same panel, right? In that, so we did match these by channel names, but it looks like we have a different antibody in these T and K sets than these BDC sets, which is comforting because that's actually what we'd expect. So we've got CD20 in some cases and CD4 in other cases. Um, so um, 
Yeah. So, okay. The, the last point where we can trip ourselves up here because of the, the fact that we're working with these as pointers to things on disk rather than data in memory is, uh, so normally in R, right, save RDS, you know, we do some work, we save RDS, we come back to it later and life is good. Um, that doesn't work with cytosets or cytoframes um, because it doesn't actually save RDS. Um, at least how we have it plumbed up doesn't know how to make a copy to the underlying data when we serialize the R side of it. So instead you need to use um, either CF write disk to save a cytoframe or save cytoset to write, save a cytoset. So let's go ahead and see what that looks like here. CF write disk, CF, and then So then hopefully we should see this. There we go. All right, so we save this in the working directory for this RStudio instance. And then if we wanted to do the same here with the cytoset, So evidently, cytosets actually save things as like a, in a directory structure, and there's a bunch of H5 files in it, and then hmm, some PB files that probably stand for protocol buffer. I don't know what that is. Hopefully, we won't have to ever po poke into the details ourselves with that. Um, okay, so uh, I am going to turn this over to Arpon, but first uh, I am going to um ask if you are a user of the cytoverse or you'd like to be a user of a cytoverse it'd be very helpful if we could know a little bit more about you um so uh and this isn't to like try to sell you ozet tm technology it's really because we have some of the maintainers of the cytoverse are within ozet and it'd be helpful to know about how we could resource this so there's a survey here um and you can fill out as much or as little if you like, or none at all. Um, but this would, yeah, this would be very helpful for us to try to resource um, support of the Cytoverse. So um, there's a link to that on the um, the rendered website here that you could fill out as a Google form. Uh, okay, so now I'm going to turn it over to Arpon to talk about um, transformation and gating. Okay, thanks Andrew for taking the time to walk us through how to import the data, how to work with it, manipulate it. Uh, the next section is on spillover transformation and a little bit of visualization. Um, for the time being, I would like to go through the vignettes instead of going to the markdown file itself, if that's okay. So uh, I'm not sure if many of you here have worked with cytometry files or experiments before, but there is a very important concept of spillover that arises whenever you're working with optics-based cytometry. So that's um, conventional cytometry, spectral, but not cytoff. And the idea essentially is a very well summarized in this picture here, um, as Andrew had alluded to earlier, we are exciting fluorophores with a specific laser and we're hoping to collect, so we're exciting, let's say this particular dye, which happens to be Fitzy, um, at about 488 nanometers. And we are trying to collect some light at the maxima, so emission maxima here. And we're wanting to say we're done. However, the excitation range of Fitzy is pretty broad. So there is a possibility that some of the fluorescence emitted by Fitzy when excited gets onto a different detector. So here, detector A is the specific detector for Fitzy, and detector B is the non-specific uh, detector for Fitzy, where some of the fluorescence has spilled over, hence the name spillover. This needs to be corrected for because it can um, significantly impact the ability to resolve the data or making any inference about the data itself. Uh, and I, I have some examples here. So in this first plot on the top, on the uh, on x-axis, we have CD3. On y-axis, we have CD5. Uh, had you not seen the plot on the right, um, 
it looks like the cells that express CD3 also express CD5. Um, that may or may not be the correct conclusion. Uh, let's assume for the timing that's not, because it is not, um, at least the way it's shown. After fixing the spillover or after correcting for this spillover issue, we see that the data is now resolved. The other issue that could potentially happen is you get wrong conclusions. So uh, unresolvable data in the first example and the second one. Here we're looking at a viability die. Uh, people generally like to call them live dead for some reason. Um, I mean, I know why, but uh, so anyways, y-axis is live dead on the x-axis it's side scatter. And it seems like there is this population that has taken up the dye. Um, generally speaking, you would want to exclude these populations. So had I just started to work with this data and then uh, without fixing uh, the spillover issue or compensating uh, as the terminology is, I might have excluded them, potentially excluding important cell types. Upon correcting the spillover issue, we notice that in fact, there is no dead cells in this particular um, uh, file so, or yeah, particular file. And in fact, this is how the file was given to us. The researchers had already gated out dead cells. So it could potentially impact your analysis um, very negatively. Correcting for sp spillover is pretty easy. Um, there is some indication of how to, how to do it if you really want to do it manually. But uh, thankfully, we don't have to do any of that. We can just use uh, the Cytoverse tools. Um, and at this point, I'm going to switch to uh, this guy here. Okay, I'm going to switch to code. Let me just clear out everything. So we start fresh. So how do we correct for spillover? Um, at the same time, what does it look like? Um, I'm just going to first complete running some of these things. OK. So uh, I hope you guys realize spillover is important. Correcting for it is important. Um, it is absolutely needed. You can't avoid it unless you have one marker. In that case, you don't need it. Or maybe two markers that are not correlated. So uh, the first question sort of is, where does spillover live? How do you use it? Um, you can get to the spillover matrix uh, by calling spillover. And your resulting output is going to be a list. So this list will have three potential slots um, with the keywords dollar spill, dollar spillover, or spill, spillover, or dollar spillover. Often, these keywords are attached to the files itself um, from the cytometer. There is an option generally in most cytometers to attach to the files. There are instances where uh, this may not be true, in which case you won't have any output. So your spillover matrix does not exist. The other scenario that could potentially happen, um, I think I have an example here. Oh, in the wrong direction. So this guy. OK, so the first example, what we had seen is there was a uh, there was a spillover matrix uh, for the timing, forget it's a matrix. But there were some spillover values that were not zeros and ones, um, non zeros and ones. And in this particular case, you see it's all zeros and ones. Um, basically, what has happened is the spillover matrix is a square matrix. In this example, it's an identity matrix, which conveys no information. So it's as good as not having any spillover matrix attached to your files at all. So if that's the case, um, there is, uh, you could fix the scenario. Hopefully, uh, either yourself or your research collaborators have provided or collected control files from which we can generate spillover matrices. There is a section that I'm not going to go over today, but we have it uh, at the end of this vignette, which you can use to sort of uh, recapitulate how do you generate a spillover matrix if you have a set of control files. Um, if not, do talk to your collaborator and see if the file is already compensated. Uh, that could be a possibility as well. Sometimes people will export out compensated files. 
Um, otherwise, uh, talk to your collaborator for some other type of resolution. Uh, so we have seen the valid spillover, and I've told you that it is a square matrix. I think we've already loaded it, so we can once again. It is a square matrix, and considering that we are doing upwards of 20 or 30 markers now, looking at all of these numbers can be quite uh, daunting. For myself, what I like to generally do is visualize this as a heat map. Um, let's see. Let's run this. In the screen, I don't know if you can see it very well, but what you're now getting to see is the information collected by the spillover matrix. The columns are the channels, the specific channels, and on the rows, it is the contribution from each of the dyes. So here I've just labeled the dyes as well, uh, along with the protein names that came uh, with the marker names. So you can see in the first channel, BB515, uh, which is dedicated for Fitzy, more or less, you're only getting a contribution from Fitzy. So you're getting 100% contribution from Fitzy and some percentage from some other markers as well. Another interesting one that is worth looking at is uh, BB610 or B610 here. So we see that this particular channel is dedicated for BB630 fluorophore, um, but it seems to also be getting some contribution from PE, as well as PE Dazzle 594. Um, if you look at the emission spectra for these two uh, fluorophores, what you'll realize is it makes perfect sense because uh, PE and BB632 are, they overlap quite a bit. So the amount of spillover that you're seeing, the high numbers make sense. But it is worthwhile checking these uh, matrices to confirm that you're not getting um, strange artifacts. Uh, but I, I, I should like to stress that these things should be optimized prior to collecting the data, uh, not post. I noticed in the scrollover matrix that there's some cases where the off diagonal entry is greater than one. Is that, is that typical or is that a concern? about using the matrix? It, it, it is possible. It is completely possible that the, you can have more contribution from a different dye onto your channel than the dye that you're looking for. Um, this is, again, an issue of optimization. Sometimes, even with all optimization, that is the scenario you fall into. However, that being said, if you, are, if you have proper controls, you've recorded your spillover matrix, when you compensate, things should be resolvable. In an unfortunate scenario where you have picked a very um, rare marker for that uh, for that particular channel or that dye, which is <clears throat> coming not as bright as whatever is contributing, this is where again uh, your SOL um, you need to optimize prior. Uh, but it is a scenario that can definitely happen. Um, you can go over 100%, 200%, 400%. Um, some people. Um, not some people, many people uh, also do correct spillover matrices uh, manually. Um, it is possible, it is doable. Uh, in Cytoverse, it's difficult to do. And I think that's bit by design, such that you're not messing around with the matrix. However, there are software packages, uh, for instance, Flojo, it does allow you to uh, edit um, the matrix. And sometimes you just get a bad spillover matrix and maybe experience tells you that I need to change some things. Um, so that is, uh, that does happen. I hope I answered the question, Andrew. Yeah. I have a question. Yes. So um, how would you know the difference between legitimate spillover versus an artifact? Because you said check for artifacts, but how, like, particularly if you're somewhat inexperienced, how would you know the difference? Yeah, um, this is where you should be uh, either talking to a collaborator or talking to the core facility people. Uh, generally speaking, if it's an artifact, if let's say you're getting negative values, generally there should be no negative values in the matrix. If you start seeing that, um, you, you should question where the spillover matrix came from because the machine is not going to output negative values. Um, you, however, you know, as a user, definitely can change those values to be negative. Very high um, values are suspect. At that point, 
I would suggest you look at the control files and see, okay, I do see there is a very high degree of overlap. Is it going to affect my marker of interest? Am I going to be able to resolve it out? Hopefully a pilot experiment is done to check all of these things. Um, but yeah, the, the point is make sure that the diagonals are one. Firstly, they need to be one. Off diagonals could be greater than one, um, should not be greater than zero, generally speaking. Um, other artifacts, oh yeah, other artifacts, important ones. Um, if you have some idea as to what the markers are, and in this scenario, I, I had some information as to P and P dazzle look very similar, you always should expect some degree of overlap. So you, you shouldn't see P and P dazzle be completely unique and distinct. So there will always be some degree of overlap that we just cannot remove, which is what we need to see. Uh, the very last thing is look at the matrix, but also um, as, we, as I scroll up, maybe here, look at the data as well. Um, once you correct for spillover, you should not see uh, events on the diagonal like this, generally speaking. Uh, things should be resolved out, or you should not th see things that are curved in or curved out. Um, if that's the case, this is when people start editing spillover matrices because things don't look as expected. Um, so very hand wavy the answer. A, a lot of it comes from just running the machine, running the, uh, or acquiring the data and seeing the data quite a bit. Um, so you get to sort of know what kind of coercion patterns you're expecting. And if for common markers, they're not holding true, in that case, you're, you must wonder, you should wonder, are my controls correct or not? I hope I answered some of the question. Yeah, that was super helpful. Thank okay. You. Um, let's see. All right, so we have, uh, we know what the spillover matrix looks like now, um, what it should normally look like, what it looks like when it's absent or uninformative. How do you correct for spillover? Um, the first thing I would like to start by saying is please only correct for spillover on your untransformed raw data. Do not transform your data and then correct uh, for spillover. Um, always start with untransformed, correct spillover, and then you can do transformations to visualize your data. So it's pretty simple to do uh, correction. So here, similar to Andrew, what I'm gonna do is simply run, so we have a method called compensate, which takes in um, a cyto frame or a cyto set, or um, it'll be revealed uh, soon enough, we'll also have a gating set. So we can give it a cyto frame for the time being and the spillover. Uh, so as we had already seen, at least I know for this particular cyto frame, it's in the third slot. I run this and then it's corrected for. Um, of course, you must have realized I didn't uh, did, do realize view, so I've change all my underlying data. So the CF is fully changed. If that's the behavior that you wanted, great. If not, um, realize view so that you're using a copy of the data. Um, there is also a method called decompensate, which then takes in your CF as well as the spillover matrix. So you can go back to your raw data uh, and inverse the operation that you just did. For being very important, uh, the spillover section is pretty short because all you have to really do is apply it. Now, once you have corrected for spillover, what do you do with the data? Um, flow cytometer data is heavily driven by visualization or uh, using visualization for your analysis. Um, and we get on to that section next. So as Andrew had shown earlier, the data is highly has a very high dynamic range. Um, distinguishing your pos true positive things, events, cells versus maybe not true positive or uh, mildly expressing cells in the raw scale is pretty difficult. Uh, I would say near impossible as is visually. So what cytometrists very often do is transform the data. And Cytoverse offers variety of uh, boilerplate functions to accomplish this. 
So we have an example of by exponential transformation here. And the population of interest that I'm looking at or looking for is monocytes that express CD14 as well as HLA-DR. Um, here, maybe these are the monocytes, maybe these are not, but upon transformation, I can clearly visualize this population right here is what I would call monocytes. You can also do log transformations. Um, the unfortunate uh, result of doing log transformations is that any values uh, at or below zero is gonna be squished to the axis. And while fluorescence measurements are not technically, should not be below zero upon compensation, so you will introduce negative values to your data. So essentially you lose information on all values that were close to uh, zero or below zero. We can do uh, inverse hyperbolic sign transformation. And this is a good example of what a poorly chosen transformation looks like. So we're making a lot of splits on the data here. So it looks like we have a very high expressing CD14 positive HLA-DR positive cell, a mildly CD14 positive HLA-DR positive cells, and maybe this is the truly negative ones. Uh, but experience tells me that this is just a poorly chosen transformation. Um, yeah, you, you can probably have a workshop or a course just on picking the right transformation. I would rather suggest talk to the collaborator, so go with experience, um, or just uh, take a look at a few articles that describe the best practices for flow cytometry data analysis. Um, the very last one that I would like to highlight is a logical transformation. Some of these work fine uh, immediately right out of the box. Some of them will need optimizations. In this case, all of them worked, um, at least these two, uh, by exponential logical work immediately. Um, yes. Maybe I'm completely off the, completely stupid in asking this. Um, may, often we have seen after the transformation or the normalization, whatever you want to call it, there's a change in the data and that would, that is sometimes viewed differently by the biologists and kids. So in this category, uh, the gating is completely black box to me. I, and I don't understand it. Yeah. In, does that make any difference? So, um, yes, we are changing the underlying data. Uh, however, what I've done is put, sort of put the axis on the scale that most biologists are used to seeing it at. So the scale more or less still conveys some meaningful information as to, oh, CD14 are high expressing. They have um, the values in expression units is very high. Um, and this is me explicitly uh, making that uh, change as I'm plotting these um, data. So I'm asking, um, let's see, in these plots, I'm essentially asking the data to be casted back in the raw scale, even though it's transformed. So at least the axes are um, in the raw scale. If you leave the data transformed, um, as I will show you, um, it will make a big difference to a biologist who's very used to seeing things visually and having what, what we used to call decades, um, first decade, second decade, fifth decade is very high and whatnot. Um, but I think it's just, if you convey that information and recast it back, it should be fine. Um, I, did I answer your question? Yeah, I mean, partly, but I mean, it's, uh, I don't, I don't work fully on that. Mm -hmm. it's partly, I mean, most of the data comes after everything has been done. Yeah. So, so many times they have said, when we go back, then you do something with the data and then bring it back to, like, going back to the original policies. Right. Then they go back and change some of the parameters and then redo the data and things like that. Right. So most often um, the parameters that probably need changing is either shifting of the gates, um, so moving gates to account for person-to-person uh, -person variability, or potentially changing transformations um, because I'm used to seeing my cells in a certain light and the transformation you picked might not reflect that. So I might change it a little bit to best suit my needs but that sort of is uh, an artifact of the manual analysis that is very prevalent in flow cytometry data analysis yeah um so these are the transformations uh that exist in uh cytoverse how do we generate them and how do you apply them um it's pretty straightforward uh so within the cytoverse within the flow workspace library we have
type in trans, you get a list of transformation that exists. So you can either populate it with, um, let's say, we have transformation that is generally applied from Flojo, which is by exponential logical transformations, so on and so forth. Um, you would start by creating a, um, a variable, uh, variable that defines your transformation. And Andrew had shown a part of this code before, and let's look at what it's doing. doing. First, let's, I'm not gonna, this portion I'm just gonna copy and paste. I am lazy. Okay, so here, what are we doing? Transform list requires a few things. So from indicates what channel do you want to um, transform right now. For from, I can indicate, uh, I think it was U75-A, that was CD4 in one of the um, files Andrea looked at. Or alternatively, I can simply say transform all the uh, channels that are present in the marker names of this particular cider frame. So we're only changing fluorescent parameters, not the uh, scatter parameters or time. And then the next is um, the function that we would like to apply. So here it's T fun, um, it's arc sine, whatever you called it. Um, and what it outputs is a list. So now there is a list that indicates, okay, these are the channels that I'm going to transform and a transformation um, for that particular channel. So we create that. Oh, oh God. Going back and forth between Mac and a PC is not easy. All right. So very last thing is to transform your data. Um, so we used transform list to create the list of transformations uh, indicating which channels we want to transform. And then finally, we will say transform the data. If I just give it CF, the side of frame or a side of set or a gating set, as Andrew had alluded to earlier, I am going to tickle this and change everything. Um, so realized view probably might be a better idea make a copy on the fly, and then transform it um, with the transformation that I, I, I want to do. So this is not going to affect the CF, uh, the original CF that I created. Um, let's see, what are we doing here? Okay. I think I'm gonna run this full line. Here I'm just showing the artifact of what happens once you transform, um, which we've already seen as a visual. So what we could actually also do is, it might be of interest to define your own transformation. Maybe what we have in Cytoverse is not of interest to you, or you know something different about the data, which probably works better. So here I'm just taking a square root of the absolute value of the expressions. So that's the transformation function that I would like to apply. Um, again, uh, create it as a function create a transform list here. Maybe uh, this is not the best route to apply to all channels, but for example, let's, we'll just take this as is. And then we finally apply it uh, as I've done before. I'm gonna run the entire block. Okay, so that's done. So at this point, I quickly want to uh, briefly talk about visualization because I have shown you visualizations, uh, but I've not told you how it's generated. For many of you who are used to using ggplot, um, it is going to be very similar, uh, the vocabulary uh, and the usage. Your workhorse, if when you're using Cytoverse um, for visualization is going to be autoplot. It's uh, uh, implemented in the ggcyto library. So autoplot basically takes a side of frame. If you have a side of frame or a side of set, and then I'm giving it the X parameter, the Y parameter, and I'm telling it how many bins does it want to create for the data. Um, once we do that, uh, 
we get to an error. Let's see. Oh, I know why. Some of these things I have not created. And let me just come down here and transform. So I transformed the data. Um, and this may or may not be the correct transformation, but it just shows you what you could potentially do by defining your own transformation. Here, I'm not able to resolve anything out. And here, I'm still able to somehow grab my CD14 cells, albeit not the best po possible way. Um, as I had said earlier, you can set, transform a set of uh, FCS files that Andrew showed as CYTOS set. So we can load a CYTOS set. Um, we compensate a CYTOS set again uh, before visualization. So um, here, instead of taking a single spillover matrix, I am taking, I'm generating a list of spillover matrix. So Andrew had shown you this function before, CYTOS set to list. Um, so it basically generates a list of CYTO frames to which I am asking Gen extract back a spillover matrix for each file. The reason is um, twofold. One, you get a specific spillover matrix per file. Assume for some reason your, each of your file has a different spillover matrix, um, even if it's the same panel. But in our case, um, when I do this, uh, we see that there is actually two different panels that show up. So as I call the marker names uh, CS, we see there's two lists of marker names. And as I, as Andrew had shown before, they have two different panels. So there is a panel for um, BN dendritic cells and there's a panel for TNNK cells. So if I were to apply a single spillover to the entire cytoset, I would definitely be um, incorrectly uh, modifying the data. So now that I have a list of compensation matrices, you can simply call the same function and provide it that list. The only um, requirement is that the names of the list need to match the names of the sample names or sample names of the cyber set. So we can do that. And uh, yeah, you'll have to take my word for it because I would like to go to the gating section. <laughs> um, yeah, there is a question uh, that I think is worth uh, bringing up. Can you tell a data is trans uh, compensated or not? Um, very often it is possible, but it is it, the level of confidence is not very high. So talk to your collaborator. Uh, visualization is a, a way to sort of discuss this or uh, get to this, but please talk to your collaborators or the flow core person, whoever gave you the data uh, to confirm if it's compensated or not. Uh, in terms of transformations, if the data uh, range looks significantly different as we see here. Oh, I have not applied. So, Let's assume that I've transformed this particular CIDR frame. If the range changes from what the machine is uh, uh, giving out to a smaller value, then you can be uh, pretty confident that the data had been transformed. You just don't know what transformation was applied because that information is not preserved in the CIDR set. Uh, that I think is a good segue to move on to the section on gating. So the whole purpose of doing an experiment with Flow cytometry experiment is so that you can actually gate on some cells, some cells of interest, um, and then make some inference about them. Uh, maybe they're your favorite cell type. You really just want to know what they express. Uh, what we have done so far is interacted directly with the files that we have uh, ingested in R, cytoframe or cytoset. Uh, what we would like to do is now make some hierarchical decisions, filtering these files uh, and events. So the events are the uh, cells that went through the lasers and be able to visualize our gating hierarchy. If it's a T cell, why is it a T cell? Why am I calling it a T cell? How did I get to this point? And that brings us to the notion of gating sets and gating hierarchy. Gating hierarchy allows us to attach these gates 
as well as visualize these gates so that you can you know, talk to the collaborator about it versus just having scripts of, I did filtering on X, I did filtering in Y, and they might say, I'm not used to seeing all of this. Um, so gating hierarchy is the unit of a gating set. Many gating hierarchies make a gating, yeah, make, make a gating set. Both are able to hold um, the hierarchy that defines the gates, or uh, also called the gating hierarchy. Um, and finally, and most importantly, all of them still point to the same underlying cytoframe frame or cytoset. set. So any changes you apply to the cytoset set will affect the gating set. Any changes you make to the gating set will affect the cytoset. set. So it goes back and forth. Um, there are three parts of this section. I'm hoping to go through just part one. Um, and I will also sprinkle in part two uh, without going through the vignettes. Part three is fully optional. Um, uh, please take a look, on, look at it. It gives you an idea as to how do you scale up when you want to gate a large number of files without wanting to script. Um, you can have a template that you essentially uh, you can use to run through the um, automated gate estimation uh, approaches that Cytiverse offers. Um, for convenience, I'm going to start again. So I have to get some, everything clean. All right. So gating set is implemented in the Flow Workspace library. So if you don't want to work with gating sets, you don't have to use Flow Workspace, but please do. Uh, I think it makes things much easier to visualize and understand. Uh, I'm also going to load in the GG Cider library, which I very briefly showed you. Uh, but gating is heavily dependent upon visualization. Um, and just loading the cache data in case we haven't done it previously already. To make a gating set, you need a cytoset. set. Hopefully at this point, if you're thinking about making a gating set, you already have a cytoset set ready. Um, for our purposes, we have a function that is just going to run through and make a cytoset set for us. So the cytoset set has about four samples and we have attached um, some metadata. Uh, these are all mock metadata. Uh, this is not metadata pertaining to this particular data set, but I just created some mock. Um, the reason having some metadata is useful is because you can do interesting visualizations. You can do interesting gating um, uh, if you have it. If you don't have it, it doesn't stop you from making a gating set. But what would you do to make a gating set once you have a cytoset set is say a gating set. And that creates a gating set. It's as simple as that. Uh, what can you do with a gating set um, is what we'll do next. Um, I first want to introduce you this concept of plotting the gating hierarchy. Um, even though it's in the next section, I don't want to miss out on that. Right now, we have nothing attached to this particular gating set. Its hierarchy is that it's at root. Um, as I um, I am going to attach gates to this, but before I do that, for the sake of time, I'm going to ask everyone to go to line 125, but do run all the codes up to that point. Um, it allows you to compute, uh, extract the spillover matrix, apply it to the gating set, again, using the same compensate method. Um, there is, gating sets are interesting. Um, one thing I would like to highlight is in the cytoframe or cytoset, you cannot tell if a cytoframe or cytoset has been compensated uh, easily uh, unless you talk to the collaborator. In a gating set, you can. Um, once applied, you can simply call this, or let's just run this, um, see what the output is. You get back your spillover matrix. So if a spillover matrix lives or is the resulting output of this particular function uh, or this particular call, that means it has been compensated, uh, which is slightly comforting to know that it's been compensated and I can uncompensate versus I have no idea what was done to it. The same is also true for transformations. If you transformed your gating set, you're able to know what transformation was applied and inverse a transformation on a side of frame and side of set, you have to keep track uh, on the script itself which is why I think it's uh, pretty neat to be working with gating sets, even though you might not be um, particularly doing gating. So here I have transformed the gating set, again, using the transform function. 
um, I have extracted the trans, uh, transformer list. Um, this is from uh, using the um, workspace files the authors provided uh, in this data. Um, and again, you can look through the code, but let's get to line 125 where the exciting stuff actually lives. So we would like to filter some cell types. This is why we have done this experiment. Um, there are many approaches of doing this. And the first ones we would like to highlight is automatic estimation of gates that simplifies your life, your collaborator's life. And we have a bunch of um, methods that exist to help you estimate gates uh, on your data. Uh, all of them live on the open CIDO library. So with an open CIDO and what these methods are, you can essentially get an idea by calling this function GT list uh, methods. So we are able to generate, um, I will go through some of them. I'm not gonna go through all of them. Um, quantile gate, what that allows you to do is estimate a cut point uh, given a uh, percentile. Um, gate quantile is a the same function. It just is called two different things um, for histor historical reasons. Range gate allows you to um, uh, provide a range and use that to gate things. Flow cluster allows you to uh, use model-based clustering to determine gate um, of a specific population. Min density is very similar to quantile. You're able to estimate cut points uh, and so on and so forth. Look at the help files uh, for many of these uh, functions to understand what the parameters are um, and how you could change them but there, most of them are pretty straightforward. And I think uh, we'll go through some of them. Uh, let's see uh, what we would like to go through first. Uh, I think this is an interesting one to go through. Uh, let me show you what a singlet gate is and why is it needed. Again, um, this data has already been pre-gated and pre-processed, uh, thankfully to the authors. Um, however, singlet gating is one of the first steps after transformation, uh, uh, correcting for your uh, spillover and transformation that you would apply to your data. And the reason you would want a singlet gate is you want to exclude anything that's a doublet. Generally speaking, in a flow cytometer that's well-tuned, well-maintained, doublets um, uh, sort of come off diagonal when you plot forward scatter area versus height. And often users would simply click around this particular uh, population and call them singlets. If you have a single file, doing this manually is not that difficult. If you have many files and they look exactly the same, uh, maybe you can copy and paste. But if they come from a variety of um, flow cytometers, a uh, variety of users, they may not look the same. And this is where you would sort of use the automatic estimation method. So the way to add gates um, is pretty straightforward and it's very clean. You call Let's, let's maybe this is where it's worthwhile typing it out. So uh, you call GS add gating method. To this, you provide your gating set, which is GS. You give it a name. So I can just call things um, singlets. Um, you tell what, what do you what do you want? You want the negative population or the positive population. Positive here is events within the gates. Gates um, negative is outside of the gates. So I want positive. What is my parent gate? So at this point there is nothing. So I would just want it to go to root. Um, let's see what else do we need. We need uh, dimensions. So what are the dimensions that we're using? So we I said it's forward scatter area and forward scatter height. If you change it to something else, it's going to try and estimate a singlet gate, um, but for those parameters. Um, so make an informed decision. When do you want to call this particular method? And the method is going to be gate. Again, to get the identity of this method, just call gt list uh, underscore list uh, underscore methods. Um, and gating args, uh, we'll look at that actually. Let's see what do we get. So it computes, um, and once it's done, it'll let us know as well. For some reason, it's taking a sweet time. Yeah. 
any inkling as to why this happened. Oh, there we go. Never mind. So um, it's done. But what is done? The best uh, way to understand what's done is to look at the hierarchy. So now we see that there is a node attached to root that we have called singlets. What does singlets look like? Um, so this is what it looked like originally, but what is the estimated gate? Um, so we visualize that as well. So I've already created the plot called singlet viz previously. And for time purposes, I think, because I won't be able to go through the GGSIO section, um, I'm gonna quickly talk about what I did here. Um, again, using the boilerplate auto plot function from GGSIDO. Here, I am extracting the Cyto sets associated with the gating set using the function GS pop get data. So all I'm saying is grab data from my gating set at the node root. So at root node, it's going to grab all the Cyto sets. I said do this for singlets. What it's going to do now is something pretty neat is it's going to do a filtration. So it'll filter down the data and only give you cytosets from this point onwards. So that's uh, why you would want a gate. So that visualization is there. To add the gate, we use terminology or vocabularies very similar to ggplot. So we have a geom gate, so geom underscore gate, to which I'm giving it uh, specific gates. gs underscore pop underscore get underscore gate. Um, very similar to the previous function, provided a gating set and tell it which node do you want to grab the gates from. Once that is done, I faceted it as well, again, uh, in a very similar vein to uh, ggplot. And why are we not visualizing this? Here we go. So now we see the singlets gate. Um, very straightforward, very easy to do. And you can scale this up to hundreds and thousands of files. Uh, and the neat thing here is it's estimating the sample by sample. So even if it's in different machines, it'll try and do the best estimation possible um, to understand what additional parameters you might use. Take a look at the help file. Um, so these are the additional arguments that you might provide to the GS add gating method. Um, and we have gating. So gating underscore args, you can provide it as a list of uh, parameters as the function requires it. Uh, I'm just going to clear that out. OK, um, another interesting gate uh, worth looking at. Um, I'm going to skip the uh, cut point estimation. Uh, let's actually get to, I am going to run it, however, though, because Everything else depends on it. Uh, do do run through this um, line by line, um, just because I've attempted to make it easy to consume for biologists as well, uh, as well as others. Um, so we have attached this live gate, and it's made a cut point uh, about here. Uh, there's two different methods I've applied, but um, either which way, we see that there's a cut point made in a variety of samples. Live gate is based, live cells are things that don't except this particular die, so a negative for this population, so on the left side. To this, uh, what I would like to do is attach a rectangular gate. Um, and why do I want to attach a rectangular gate? Let's run it um, and see. This data set, uh, this particular panel is looking at T cells. And it seems like what I would like to grab is a population of T cells called mate cells that express CD161 on the Y axis and uh, V alpha 7 2 on the X axis. So I would like to sort of estimate a point around here, but I don't want to manually compute what these points are. Um, so I would like to use the gating method approach where I'm going to um, let's run this line by line as well. Um, GS gating method. So we're going to add it to our gating set. Uh, we would like to call it mate cells. 
And this is where things are slightly interesting. Very similar to how you would describe it. Positive for CD161, positive for V alpha 7-2, you would say your population is going to be double positive. So now it's looking at two different axes. What is the parent? Uh, at this point, I would like the parent to be alive because I've already computed that. I've already attached that for the dimensions. Um, even though here I'm giving it the specific channel names, um, you don't have to. I can simply say um, for my channel names, I would like CD161 and um, V alpha 7 underscore 2. And the gating method that I would like to use is, let's see, uh, on tile. Let's wrap this in quotes. And now here, we want to give some kind of argument because, again, visualization helps. You know that the population of interest sort of should live somewhere between 100 and 200 and 0 or um, 0 and 200. So there's no point in looking at any events below these values. So you can start providing additional arguments. This is the minimum data range. This is the maximum data range and percentile. You know, let's take um, uh, 95th percentile. So uh, this. And let's actually just leave it at that and see what the output is. So it's done estimating. It's now done estimating when you call, call plot GS. What you'll now see is multiple nodes being attached. So we had the live as well as the second gate that I didn't talk about. So live gate was attached to which this is the population of interest made cells, which is what I really want. But it has also given you back um, some uh, population called CD161 positive and CD, uh, V alpha 7.2 negative. It's because we are using a quantile gate first to estimate the positive events on these things and then using that information to identify where the mate cells are. And very last, we will visualize this if, uh, to confirm if this is did what I really wanted it to do or should we make changes. So more or less, it looks like it definitely grabbed the right population. Uh, are you guys able to see this clearly or is this too small? Here we go. So more or less, it has grabbed mate cells. Um, so it seems like it did the right thing. It, did, it does look like um, some other cells are uh, grabbed as well, which might not be useful. Uh, this is where you would want to optimize the arguments that you provide to the, uh, 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 to the method itself. Now, say that this is not optimal, you, you don't like this at all, and you'd want to remove this gate so that we can recompute. How do you do this? You do uh, GS remove gating method. Uh, some of these are the answers to the exercises, but I think it's worthwhile showing. Um, it is important to note that this GS remove gating method walks back in a stepwise manner. Every time you call GS add gating method, it uh, makes a note of what function was called, what gate was attached. So when you call GS remove gating method, it's removing the last gate that was attached. And we can confirm that by plotting it again. So we have lost all three gates that have been attached. Uh, at this point, say these are the optimized parameters that you wanted. Um, we compute and then we visualize again. And now you say, oh, okay, this is this looks nice. I am you know, being a little bit stringent about what I call mate cells, but at least I don't have any false positives. Um, I'm not gonna go through, actually, I think this is interesting. I mean, everything here is interesting. I just don't have time. Um, quad gates. Quad gates are, are definitely worthwhile uh, and are worth going through. Um, here I've switched. I see. Yes, thank you, Andrew. A few minutes. <laughs> okay. All right. So Andrew very rightly pointed that, let's look at the geometry of what um, these things do. The singlets gate gave you a polygon. Um, the a gate quantile or min density gives you a cut point, so it gives you a range. Um, 
we got uh, to take a look at the rectangle gate uh, here to get, grab our mate cells. And here we are using flow class 2D to estimate an ellipsoid. Um, and this is a semi-supervised approach, which is why I keep harping on the point that you know, visualization is key. So what I'm trying to do here is so the way this gate is estimated is I first visualized uh, CD3 versus CD4. And for some reason, I really wanted CD3 positive, CD4 negative populations. Um, but I don't want to go around and make an ellipsoid manually or define an ellipsoid manually or use a rectangle gate. So I would like to use this um, uh, estimation method called gate flow cluster. Uh, please take a look at the help file to understand what the arguments. But the key argument here um, that I would like to point out is target. So I'm specifying a, a target um, as well as the number of clusters I want to estimate. So K is the number of clusters, target is here. What I'm suggesting to FlowCluster is do your model-based clustering. There's You should estimate three clusters. And of those three clusters, return back to me a cluster that's around this particular centroid. 100 on the um, um, x-axis and 150 on the y-axis. Um, so that's going to be your CD3 uh, positive T cells. If I wanted CD4 T cells, I would have changed that to maybe 100, 200 or 175 on the x-axis and 150 on the y-axis. Of course, you can use these methods to make things uh, much more programmatic. Um, we're not going to go over here, but we have plenty of examples in cytoverse.org, uh, which highlights these functions. Um, the next one that I want to talk about is quad gate. Um, do we have the details here? Okay. Um, is it okay if I keep going? Yeah, I don't hear no, so I'm going to keep going. <laughs> As I wrote this, I, I was, uh, as Andrew said, that you were being very ambitious um, to try and get through this um, in set time. Um, so what are quad gates? Why do we want them? So often it's, it's, so, ah, I have created, so th this is an interesting thing that has just happened. So I have created a plot uh, using ggcyto. Uh, this is the first time you have seen this function, ggcyto, which lives in the library of ggcyto. I like ggcyto function better than autoplot because it's a little bit more malleable. Um, ggcyto takes a, for an argument, cyto frame, cyto set, or a gating set. If you have a gating set or a gating hierarchy, you can provide subset, which, as the name suggests, is basically the node that you like to plot. Here, I've asked it to plot CD3 positive cells, but I've never estimated or attached this particular gate. But it's okay because it's not computing any of that yet. And uh, in a very similar fashion to ggplot, I provide uh, X and Y aesthetics. So CD4 to RA, CCR7, um, geom underscore hex is to plot its as hexagonal bins, and I'm faceting it. So when I call T, um, it's telling me, well, you want to plot CD3 positive, but that doesn't exist. So I don't know where to extract the data from. So first thing let's do is let's actually run this line of code to estimate uh, and add our CD3 positive gate. I'm not going to go through the visualization because we already saw that. It's done. You have to believe me that it's done. But if you don't, you can do plot GS. And we see that CD3 is populated now. Um, unlike autoplot method, you must have noticed I did not extract a cyto frame or a cyto set. I simply provided the node from which I want the data to be plotted. This is uh, why I like this particular function better, is it gives me um, uh, fine grain control over what I plot. And now I can plot um, heel subsets, which might be better plotting it from document here. It's larger. So often um, you might want all four populations that is in this particular um, visualization. So these are your naive cells. So they are double positive for RA and CCR7. You have your EMRA cells, CD4 RA positive, CCR7 negative, double negative cells. These are effector cells and your memory cells that would potentially live in this quadrant. So imagine there is a a quadrant here, and you would want all those populations. And this is where you'd want to call gate quadrant. 
Um, and the way we do that um, is uh, slightly interesting. I'm not, I'm no longer defining an alias as a specific node. Rather, I'm saying uh, the alias argument I'm providing as an asterisk, uh, indicating grab all four populations, positive and negative, and label it as such. The pop argument is no longer positive, negative, positive, positive, negative, negative. It's at this point, essentially say, this is the argument that you want to make whenever you want to do a quad gate. It's plus minus, plus minus. That indicates to GS at gating method that you would want a quad gate back. Dimensions, cd 4 ra CCR7, even though um, you may or may not have realized, names, yes. marker names have a lot of uh, junk attached to them, which is informative, but it's not cd 4 ra and CCR7. That being said, uh, it's OK if you're being slightly lazy as long as there's no overlap. And finally, I'm calling this function gate quad sequential, which is going to take for an argument a function. In this case, we're giving it min density. And let's open that up as well, the help file. So it takes in um, a flow frame, cyto frame, cyto set, gating set channels, which are the dimensions which have already provided. But this gfunc is essentially, you, you want it to provide the function that you want to use to estimate the cut points. You can as well give it min and max range to filter the data um, further. So we run that. Now, um, we have also introduced a few new things here. Uh, but before that, visualization is key because you don't have to believe that I, what I did is correct. Um, and the way to do that in a very fast manner is to just call autoplot GS. I'm going to increase the bin size to 128. Ah, this is also good. I'm, I'm glad all these errors are coming about. So in autoplot, unlike GG Saito, the, uh, the function, when you call GS, it doesn't know what to do. What you want to do, you can't give it a gating set. You have to give it a gating hierarchy or you have to specify the gate that you would like to plot by saying plot uh, gate as x, y, and z. But we just estimated four gates. I don't know the names. So what I would like to do is visualize everything. So I've given it a gating hierarchy. And now I see on the right side here the gates that have been attached. So there are four gets, gates estimated. Um, uh, the naive cells are clearly the most populous and are grabbed pretty easily. But you do see that there is, uh, depending on the data, depending on the staining quality, uh, optimization of the experiments, you will have to optimize it uh, a little bit, but it simplifies everything after that. The other argument that I provided to uh, GS add gating method is this collapse data for gating. So you have an opportunity to say, I would like to collapse in my entirety of uh, Cytoframe at the node, um, where's the parent, at the node CD3 and then estimate um, this particular gate such that the gate that is uh, resulting is gonna be the exact same for all the files. Um, and that's an assumption that I made, but it doesn't work because I didn't supply group by argument, which then further tells, I would like to collapse my gate, but I would like to group it by certain uh, metadata parameter. So here I could have said uh, treatment um, or status, if that's of interest to you. I'm not going to go through that right now because the next portion is, all right, you would say, Arpan, it's good. You can estimate a lot of you know geometric things. What if I really want to gate things that look like a star? I want to make a star gate. Um, sure, you can make a star gate as well. This is where uh, things become slightly more uh, verbose but still very uh, programmatic. It is going to be driven at this point completely by visualization because you're going to start defining your gates uh, in a very manual format. So imagine you wanted a CD3 gate. Um, I would like to draw a rectangle. Instead of uh, going through code, I'm going to actually go back to the vignette because we have that done. So I wanted to create a rectangular gate, which I could have done with the GS add gating method, but Imagine it doesn't work because your data is very unique. You have very rare cells. 
and you know exactly where to plot your data. You simply create a rectangular gate by providing a matrix of ranges. So I'm providing ranges of values. How am I getting these ranges? These ranges are defined by looking at the plots. So I'm saying, OK, for my x-axis, go from 140 to 205. For my y-axis, go from 0 to 200. So x-axis, y-axis, it's going to be a square matrix, of course. And I'm going to label my axes as well. The columns of the axes or the matrix are going to be the channel names. This is key. At this point onwards, you can no longer say CD3, CD4. You have to start referring to it with specific channel names. Um, if you don't remember the channel names and you don't want to call marker names all the time, you can call get channel marker function. It'll provide you back uh, the name of the channel as well as the marker name itself. So we have constructed a rectangular gate and uh, in a matrix form to now con coerce it into a rectangle gate that Cytoverse recognizes, we simply call rectangle gate. We have a bunch of these gates. Um, the easiest way for me to even remember what these are is type gate and see what kind of gates do we have. There are a bunch of them. Please read through the vignettes. Um, we provide a 10 second summary of what's on the rest of the vignettes so people know where to look. And what yes. All right. Quick summary uh, when you have, if you have questions. The rest of the vignettes go over how do you create add, remove, change your manually created gates, as well as it goes over concept of um, recomputing. Just because you added a gate does not mean it recomputes the data. Um, examples are here uh, for this particular workshop. However, we have also um, provided example, uh, I think it's probably in the top here. If you go to cytoverse.org, uh, we have a link somewhere. If you go to cytoverse.org, uh, we basically have much more expansive examples of uh, edge cases as well, how you could use the Cytoverse to um, extract, make interesting gates, variety of gates. Uh, I've been using visualizations quite a bit, uh, but I didn't get a good chance to go over them. So use this particular vignette to get your uh, feet wet as to how do you visualize it. It's very similar to running ggplot. Um, uses ggplot in the back end uh, and that approach is going to be uh, translatable very easily uh, but again look through the examples in cytoverse.org to get an idea uh, for more comprehensive examples we have been gating things um, and i've been visualizing these gates but very often what you want is some kind of information as to what did i gate what the frequency was what the mfi was or the uh, median fluorescence intensity um, so you want to be able to access the data that has been gated. Um, so we did see some of these functions, GS get pop meth, um, GS pop get gate or data. As well, we saw this plot uh, uh, function to get the gating tree. This is very informative to uh, you know make some visual. In, uh, visually, this is very informative, but programmatically, if you want to type everything out, it's going to be very difficult. So you can simplify that also by calling GS get pop paths, which gives you the entirety of the path that you have applied to your gating set. And then you can start uh, extracting specific um, events from this, these um, gates. At the end of the day, gates act as a filter. Uh, so you're filtering your data and you're looking at it through that angle. Um, let me see. I'm gonna jump to reporting. Once you're done gating, once you're done filtering, um, if you want to get counts, frequencies, events, very uh, simple call to GS pop get count fast, uh, gives you the count fast. Uh, you can tell it the statistic that you want. Do you want the actual counts of the event of cells in that particular gate, or do you want frequencies? So you can change those things as well. Um, and this is just an example of what you get. And what you get actually is the entirety of the gating hierarchy. So you can get this is how what I started with that singlet node, and at particular um, double negative T cells, it was uh, a thousand cells. So that might be of interest to you. Um, you can change it to frequency, like I said before, and you'll get frequencies immediately uh, in terms of the immediate parent. 
So a root is going to be its own parent. So there is going to be one. A singlet will have root as its parent. So I'm starting to get, report frequencies as its parent. And of course, once you have this as a data frame, which is the output, you can change it and manipulate it however you want. Um, as well, whoops. Yeah, there is some additional interesting function that really simplify uh, reporting uh, using the Cytiverse. Um, you can start extracting specific information from a variety of nodes and define your own functions that you want to use as well. Um, I know I, <laughs> I went quite a bit over time. My apologies for that. I kind of saw this uh, coming about, but any questions in this uh, very fast walkthrough of the Cytiverse? Come find us at coffee hour, or we'll be at the poster session, manning the booth yes. tomorrow afternoon. We've got sunglasses and <laughs> stickers, <laughs> good vibes. Yeah. Otherwise, do reach out to us. Uh, uh, I think our email addresses are in the vignettes. Um, yeah, and we can. We're more than happy to get back with answers to your questions. All right. Thank you, everyone.